Romans chapter number 14. We're continuing our look through Paul's epistles right now. It's a, it's a study of the entire chart, actually. We started in Genesis. But obviously, I'm going to slow down in Paul's epistles because it is the doctrine to you and about us uh, as members of the body of Christ. Uh, the last few weeks, we've been looking at the issue of the judgment seat of Christ. Now, if you weren't with us last week, make sure you get the, 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 the study because last week we looked at exactly what is this reward of the inheritance that the Apostle Paul spoke about. And to know what it is, is a great motivation to seek it. Uh, not every believer in the church, the body of Christ, yea, most believers won't receive the reward of the inheritance. Because the reward of the inheritance, all believers inherit the heavenly places. But there is a reward associated with that inheritance that only faithful believers those who are faithful to the end will receive, to the end of their life or to the rapture. And it has to do with how faithful you are to the Pauline grace message, which most of the saints aren't. And how faithful you are to that Pauline grace message, it will, be, it will directly affect the glory that you exhibit in your new bodies. Paul makes that clear. 1 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians 5, Philippians 3. He talks about this glory, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. To share. God has called each member to share equally in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. The same glory he has, we're, each of us are to have. But not each of us is going to share in that same glory. And, and to sum it up, we saw that just like in the military, when you can look at a military officer and tell by his uniform and, and his stars and, and what was, what's on him or his, uh, how he's adorned, his particular rank and authority in the military, his authority, that's the same way it's going to be when we get to heaven. Based on our faithfulness over little down here, he'll make you ruler over much of the heavenly places, and you'll be known in the heavenly places eternally by the glory that your new body bears. Now make sure you get that, okay? It's that eternal weight of glory, that gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble. But here, as we leave the judgment seat of Christ, we're moving on through the, the book of Romans, and we're going to finish the book today, hopefully. We want to look at what the Apostle Paul is dealing with. Uh, chapter 14 of Romans, look at verse 12. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. That's the judgment seat of Christ. Let us not, therefore, judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. That's the point of Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 shows each of us as believers how we deal with one another, particularly in the differences. You're going to have differences of opinions, differences of how you even see the scriptures. That's, that's fine because we're different as far as humanity. Our, our human flesh, there's differences. I have differences with my own wife, who's most like me of any human I ever met. Krista, we're, we're so one soul, but we have men and women differences. I'm sure any of you men and women who are married, you have differences with your spouse. Well, you're going to have differences within the body, and it's how you handle those differences. I saw Vanetta hit, hit her husband. <laughs> watch out, Manly, watch out. It's how you handle those differences is what is important. And it's okay to have differences. Look at chapter 14, verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. These less essential things of the grace doctrine, of the grace message is what it is. In particular, what I see in that passage, the, the strong brother was the one who understood the freedom he has in Christ through the grace message. The weaker brother was the one with the religious baggage. In particular, there were Jews in the Roman, uh, in these Roman assemblies who had this legalistic system that they grew up in, and they ha it took them time to learn that they weren't under the bondage of that law. The Gentiles who had not the law, they were free in grace. Look at the Corinthians. The Corinthians were so free, they were abusing the grace of God. The Galatians were so under that legalistic system, they weren't resting in the grace of God. And either extreme is the flesh. Here's how you deal with the differences. The weaker brother had the religious baggage. I deal with people all the time who have come out of religion. I wasn't really in religion. I got saved right into the grace message. So it wasn't a lot of baggage. But there are a lot of people who were in religion who come to the grace message and they have this religious, religious baggage. You don't pound them for it. You just kind of minister to them and bring them on out slowly. Okay? And those who have the religious baggage, that legalism, you don't sit and, 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 and look what Paul says there in verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? 
The judging has to do with the weaker brother with the stronger. Don't you interrogate your brother's freedom, his, his liberty. And then the, 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 in verse 10, why dost thou set it not thy brother? That's the stronger brother. He is not to pretend like his brother means nothing to him just because he doesn't know what he knows. So it's how we deal with one another is the issue. Look at verse 13. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore. And in particular, in the case, it has to do with these less essential things about grace. I, I, I'm asked so much about my opinion on things. It's, it's amazing because I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a counselor. And I always tell the people, here's what I would do if I was in your situation because I can't tell you what to do. It's not my job. It's the Lord's job to tell you what to do. But if, if I hear your situation, which I do, I'll say, if I was in your shoes, here's what I would do. Now, most of the time, people take that advice, but sometimes they don't because they have to be the one to make the decision. So when it comes to the non-essential things of the, of, of the freedom we have in Christ, you're not to judge. But here's what you're to do. Verse 13, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather. Here's what you to discern. Here's what you to think about. Judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Can I tell you, you're not supposed to be the per, uh, uh, someone who hinders the spiritual growth of another believer. If what you're doing hinders their spiritual growth, now look how I said that. You can do things that the Apostle Paul tells you to do, that's to edify them. But if what you're doing is a stumbling block to their spiritual growth, or it, an occasion for them to fall, then don't do it. Um, let, me sh let me show you some, what he means by that. Hold your hand here and go to Leviticus chapter 19. It's an interesting passage. Go back to the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus lets, sets out the law. The, the tribe of Levi was, the, was the, the tribe that God desired to be the priest of Israel. Leviticus chapter number 19, look at verse 11, if you will. Just to get the context... God, through Moses, is laying out his laws and statutes and ordinances to the nation of Israel. He's telling them what to do and what not to do. Now watch what he says in the context. Uh, verse 11, ye shall not steal. Okay? We know thou shalt not steal. But then he, he shows you what to do. Neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another. Here's how Jews were to deal with each other. Uh, and ye shall not swear by my name falsely. That's taking the name of the Lord God in vain. Neither shalt thou profane the name of of thy God, I am the Lord. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor. We saw this issue of, of, of defraud in the first session. Paul uses that in the context of fornication. Uh, to, to take away what's rightfully your brother's. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. The wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. Thou shalt not curse the deaf, now watch this, nor put a stumbling block before the who? The blind but shall fear thy God, I am the Lord. What's going on there is there were people in Israel who were, were born deaf, things like that, and God would heal them, and there, there was some, some pr pr provision. But he says, don't curse the deaf. Don't sit and say things to them people who can't hear what you have to say. Neither put a stumbling block before the blind. What is that? Well, when a blind person is walking, you see them with their cane, they're kind of feeling their way through. And that would be a dastardly thing to put a, bl a block in front of them so that they trip over it. Well, you can do that, spiritually speaking, with, 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 with saints. You can be a stumbling block to their edification. That's what Paul is talking about. Go back to uh, the book of Romans. When he talks about being a stumbling block, don't you be the reason why they fall in the faith. Paul tells us we need to be the person that helps build them up. Make sure you help building them up and not bringing them down. That's the point. He talks about in verse 13, Romans 14, verse 13, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Now, I said, I said, don't be a, a, a stumbling block to the edification, because in the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ was a stumbling block. But God gave him for the edification of the nation of Israel. It was their fault he was a stumbling block. If you're, if, if you're giving someone the truth of God's word is a stumbling block, that's okay. Here was the truth, okay? God is not saying don't give people truth. You give them the truth in love. And if they stumble upon that truth because of their hard heart, that's their problem. 
But don't you do anything outside of giving truth that could offend your brother. That would be a, 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 an occasion to fall. He's going to show you. Let's, let's look at this. Uh, hold your hand here. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. We live in a, such a different culture than this culture. But these Gentiles would worship in these idol temples. And part of the worship was sacrificing animals like Israel did. But Paul says that when the Gentiles would sacrifice those calves and those lambs, they were sacrificing to devils. But just like Israel, when that animal sacrificed, the priest in the temple in Israel would, would take some of the meat that wasn't burnt in the burnt offering, and it would be their meat. God provided for the house of those priests through the other members of the, the nation. Their food, their drink, their livelihood, just like he provides for the ministry here. Your offerings provide for me and my wife and children, that type of stuff. Well, it was the same in Israel. Well, here, these Gentiles were doing that same thing. And, and when, when, it, when, it, when you sacrifice that animal, some of, the food, some of the meat was left over to eat. Watch what happens. 1 Corinthians 8, look at verse 9. In fact, start at verse 7. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge, speaking about the Lord. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. Now what's going on? There were those grace believers in Corinth who came out of that Gentile heathen idolatry. Paul is saying the meat itself is no big deal. It's just an animal. It's good food. Eat the meat if you can handle it. But some of the men were sitting there. I'll give you a case in point. Let's say a Jewish person is in our, in our midst today. He grew up or he or she grew up in a kosher family where they only ate what the Bible calls clean meats. They get saved. They believe Christ is the Messiah and that he died on the cross for their sins. They get saved. They're part of our assembly. But because of their religious background, they didn't eat let's say, pork, okay? They, they couldn't eat the swine. It was unclean. We have the Lord's Supper, and someone brings some nice pork, which enjoy it, right? But if you're in, the, in, 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 you're in the presence of that brother or sister who come out of that religious background where they didn't eat the pork, what Paul would have you do is don't eat the pork in their presence if it's offended them. You understand that? Now, if they're not there that day, enjoy the pork, but in their presence. That's what he's saying. They have conscience of it's unclean to them, and that's the point. Uh, look at verse 8. But meat commendeth us not to God, for, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. Today, we're not under the law. There's no unclean meats today, Paul is going to tell us. But if you're eating that meat, and that was what's going on here, offended your brother, Paul says don't eat the meat in their presence. That's what he's saying. Um, verse 9. But take heed lest by any means this, what's that next word? Liberty. See, there's freedom in Christ. Legalists don't get it. They think that you're going to stop sinning if, 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 you, if they give you a set of rules and regulations. The strength of sin is the law. God gave the law to Israel to put them under bondage. It was a schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. The strength of sin is the law. Grace gives you the power to live the Christian life. You got freedom and liberty. You're free. Do you know that God looks at your life the way he looks at his son? Let me ask you, when God looks at the Lord Jesus Christ, is he ready to pound them? Well, watch this. When the Lord Jesus Christ is in the presence of his father, is he all afraid? Man, they got a free exchange of love. That's how God sees you. That's how he sees you. He doesn't, he, he's not trying to pound you for everything or expect you to be on eggshells. You're free. Relax in Christ. You have the same relationship with the Father that the Lord has. Always remember that. When you find yourself being uh, held in bondage by your own religious past or, or some family members who are religious, just remember, wait a minute, no, no, no. I'm before the Lord like the Lord. I'm before the Father like the Lord. I'm free. That's how God sees you. But can I tell you something? Here, when you're dealing with weaker brethren, now, by the way, this has to do with members of the same assembly, People who believe the Pauline grace message. That's important. I will never let some religious legalist brother or sister outside of our, 
inside or outside. You don't let a legalist put you under bondage. Don't do that. But if it's a weaker brother here in our assembly or weaker sister who says, Brother Ron, that offends me because that, you know, whatever the, the deal is, we'll talk about it and I'll, I'll not do it for their sake. Not, to, not, not so that they can stay a legalist, but so they can grow. I'm going to make sure they grow in grace. They're going to get that religious bondage out of their thinking, okay? Look here. Verse 9, but take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are what? Weak. Weakness means that they're growing. Weakness does not mean they're going to stay a legalist. That's the point. These are people who are just new to the faith or they have religious baggage, but they're growing in Pauline doctrine. You give them time. He's not talking about somebody who's going to be like the Galatians, just be a, 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 a legalist. Verse 10, for if any man see thee which has knowledge... That's the knowledge of the meat that is just meat. Sit at meat in the idol's temple. Shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to the idols? They look at the strong ones. It's just like children. When, when there's two siblings, the, the younger child looks for guidance from the older one. The younger child says, oh, if my big brother does it, then I can do it. But they may not be spirit, mature enough to handle whatever the, the thing is. That's what's going on here. Verse 11. And through thy knowledge, and that's the knowledge that all meats are clean, shall the weak brother, what's that next word? And that issue of perish doesn't mean he's going to lose his salvation. His conscience is wounded. His conscience is destroyed. He's going to have, he won't have the victory that God had given him in Christ because he hasn't grown yet for whom Christ died. Verse 12, but when ye sin so against the brethren, that's sin, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against who? Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest, my, lest I make my brother to offend. Paul, who was one of those religious Jews who was under that bondage of not eating certain meats, when he learned that he could eat all meats, and we're going to see that in Romans 14, he ate it. When he was around those Gentiles, he ate like a Gentile. But can I tell you, when Paul was amongst the Jews, particularly the Jewish members of the body, who came from that background like him, he wouldn't eat that meat. Peter, Galatians 2. Peter learned the change in the program. He was amongst these Gentiles over in Galatia eating meats, like Gentiles. When these Jewish believers from, from, from Jerusalem came, their religious zealots, those uh, legalists, Peter withdrew himself and, and, and pretended he was a, Jewish, a Jew again and separated himself from the Gentiles. When Peter was among the Gentiles, he ate like Gentiles after Paul showed him there was a change. Go back to Romans 14. Watch what the Apostle Paul, how he sums this up. The point is, you have freedom in Christ. But if your freedom offends one of your weaker brethren, just forbear them. And when you're in their presence, don't do whatever. That's how you live. Watch this. Uh, verse 14, Romans 14, verse 14. I, what? No. And am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean. Now, what's those next two words? To him it is unclean. Now, that's the difference between legalism and grace. If you don't, you know, I, I remember when, when I first got in the grace message, I understood the freedom that was in Christ. I was that heathen Gentile who needed a savior. I was, there, was a, there was a grace believer, a woman who comes and says, Brother Ron, you shouldn't watch TV. I looked at her. I mean, it shocked me. I said, what, what are you talking about? You shouldn't watch TV or go to the movies. And I didn't say it to her, but in my mind, my mind I was like, she's nuts. This lady's nuts. Because I'm about to go, when I leave church, I'm going to go watch the Bears lose. You know, I said, no. <laughs> who said Amen. <laughs> But that was crazy. I said, what do you mean we can't watch TV? You can use TV and the internet and all that for good. I, we, we preach the gospel on the television. And we get the, the message out. And, and what it was is she, was, she, was, she came out of this religious background where they didn't, the ladies couldn't wear uh, anything but dresses. And they couldn't go to the movies. They couldn't go dancing out with their family. And it was crazy. It was just religious baggage. And I said, that's crazy. Well, that's where she was, but I said, I'm not going to be under that bondage. Um, 
Look what he says here. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 14, that there is nothing unclean of itself. When the Apostle Paul says, I know, he's saying the doctrine teaches that all meats are clean. By the way, you can see that in the book of Acts. Peter gets a vision in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 10, where God puts down this, this sheep and has all these unclean animals, and then God says they're clean. That happened after Paul was saved. Over in Acts 9, that was Acts 10. It was at that moment when God changed the program that now he freed up the, the dietary laws. Okay, Paul understood that. But see, Paul did not just know that. He believed it. Look what he says in verse 14. I know and am persuaded. That's two different things. You can know something from God's word but not believe it. You know that? I, I deal with believers all the time. I'll say, here's what Paul says about it. But they, they, they don't believe it. They're not persuaded yet. Yet. They don't get it. That's the point. So Paul not only understood the doctrine says that all meats are clean, but God's word through the Lord Jesus Christ persuaded Paul. Look what he says. I know and am persuaded by who? The Lord Jesus. That there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him is unclean. That's my point. That's why I brought up. So I told the woman after reading this, I said, uh, I ain't going to say the sister's name. I said, uh, if you don't want to watch TV, that's fine. But you can't put that on other believers. You know that? You can't, you can't say, well, since I don't watch TV, all believers should. You do that. And here's what happened. The week after I told her that, I saw her the next Sunday and I said, so how's that not watching TV going? She says, well, you know, I did watch the news and blah, 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 blah. She, she you can't, they, they don't keep the law. She didn't even keep her own little rule. Uh, there's, a, there's a brother out there who, the Bible says that the position that I hold here is called a bishop. It, it is, it is, a bishop. He's stern on that position. Call me bishop, bishop. Okay, I'll call you bishop. But so that... I won't confuse someone. If I tell people, as a black man, if I tell somebody I'm bishop, some bishop knight of this, they'll think I'm in some apostolic like Bishop T.D. Jakes. You know who that is? Because the word bishop has been hijacked by religion. In the, like in Roman Catholicism and stuff, if you say the word bishop, you think of somebody with a goofy little hat and a big robe carrying this staff doing this. So for, <laughs> am I right? Yeah, it's, worth about that much. it's worth about that much, right, Chell? But the fact is, do I know that it's called a bishop? Yes. But do I have a problem with someone calling me pastor? When somebody says, what can I call you? I say, call me Brother Ron. This guy, he's, he's, he, he, gets on, he gets on brothers and sisters. He's a grace pastor. But he gets on you if you use the word pastor. He gets on you. I've had some saints come and say, that brother got on me. I know what they're talking about. If that's what that brother wants to be called, go for it. But he can't force that on others. You understand that? I know why I don't use that term so much because religion hijacking. I don't want anybody thinking I'm like apostolic T.D. Jakes or something. Because if I say I'm Bishop Ron Knight, they're going to think that. So I say, just call me Brother Ron. I'm, I'm the minister, the pastor of Twin Cities Grace Fellowship. I know that's, so basically what I'm saying is, if, if, if that's unclean to him, it's unclean to him. But he can't force it on everybody else. Well, that's how grace works, okay? If you're so persuaded about something from the grace message, good for you. But you can't force your, your beliefs on everyone else, okay? That's the point. Look at verse 15, Romans 14, 15. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat. Let me, let me say it like this. Since, since we don't have an issue of meat and drink. If I insisted that you call me bishop, call me bishop. You could be grieved by that because I keep saying Every time you say the word pastor, I'm jumping on you. You'll be grieved, and I will not be walking charitably. You know that? That's what he's saying. I'll use the word. You use whatever word you want to use from God's word. That's fine. I don't call children kids. Well, I do. I call lost people children kids. Kids in the Bible is a term for a sin offering. You look up the term kid, it's always... A, a kid is, a, is an animal that was sacrificed for a sin offering. That's why, a lot, that's why the world calls their children kids, because spiritually speaking, they're sacrificing their children on an idol, a Satan's idol, uh, uh, altar. I call 
children what the Bible calls them. Little ones, children, babes. But if you call, we call, people call children kids all the time. I don't jump on them, you know what I mean? I just don't use that term. That's what he's talking about. I can't grieve you with, with how I, I do things. That's the point. If I do that, I won't walk charitably. You call them what you want. If somebody asks me, I'll tell them what, what I believe. That's what he's talking about. Look at verse 15. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat or whatever you stand on, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. What you can do when you pound someone about these things, you can destroy their faith. Grace has to deal with freedom of choice. You know, people go around, legalists say, well, you're this, you're that. God is going to get you for that, get you for that. No, no, no. Everyone's a sinner. Everyone is a sinner before God if they're, in, if they're not in Christ. You don't pick certain sins just because that's not what you do. You just deal with people on the fact that, hey, this is particular, this is a sin before God. You need a Savior. Christ died for that sin. And God will clean them up. That's the point. Legalists don't want to give God time to clean somebody up. Grace does. Look what he says here. Verse 16, let not then, who's good? You're good. Hey, man, if, if that's what you believe, that's good for you. Don't let your good be what? Evil spoken of. That guy who's insist you call him a bishop. I've had saints come and say, hey, the guy pounded me. Now, to me, that's, that's evilness. Don't be pounding saints for stuff. You don't pound grace believers just because they don't do or say things your way. That's what Paul is talking about. Look at verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but what? Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, at the, for the rest of this time, I'm going to show the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Because I get that question almost daily. Someone would say, well, well Brother Ron... What is the kingdom of heaven? What is the kingdom of God? Well, look, look, look how Paul describes this thing here. For the kingdom of God is not meat or drink. He's saying kingdom, king's dominion. God's, God is a king. He has a dominion. It's not meat or drink. He's saying that's not the issue. What's the issue? Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness. Doing what's right. Doing those things which make for peace and having joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, the issue of being the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has to do with two spheres. Um, I'm going to erase this so that I can show you visually what I'm, what I'm talking about. There are two terms that the Bible uses to describe God's dominion. <clears throat> Excuse me on this side. There's the kingdom... A king's dominion, that's what that means, a king's dominion of God. And then the kingdom of what? Heaven, right? Okay. This term is used by all the Bible writers. Uh, this is, the Lord uses this term. John the Baptist uses this term. Paul, uh, the, the 12 apostles and the apostle Paul uses this term. All of them use that term except Paul. Paul does not use this term kingdom of heaven. This particular term, kingdom of heaven, has to do with the earthly sphere of God's dominion. God is a king, and when you come to the apostle Paul, the, God's kingdom has a twofold sphere. In the beginning, God created the what? Heaven and the earth. The kingdom of God, his dominion extends in two realms from creation, heaven and earth. When we talk about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I'll show you, it's, it's referring to the earth, the earthly kingdom. When Paul refers to it, he's, he's referring to the heavenly kingdom, okay? This kingdom of God. It has two spheres. I'll show you that. Let's look at it. First, go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. When Paul uses that term, here's what he's referring to. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Look at verse 18, please. 2 Timothy 4, verse 18. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his what? 
heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. When Paul refers to the kingdom of God, particularly, he's referring to the heavenly kingdom. We're going to go as members of the body of Christ up in the rapture and take the thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers up in the heavenly places. That's what the body of Christ is created for. There's no need for the body of Christ to rule on the earth. Israel is there. Now watch how that term kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven is used interchangeably in the Gospels. Uh, go with me, if you will, to uh, let's start, if you will, in Luke chapter 17. Yeah, let's go to Luke, the book of. No, start in Matthew. Let's go to the beginning. Matthew chapter number three. We'll start right from the beginning. John the Baptist came preaching. Matthew chapter three, if you will. Look at verse one. Matthew three, verse one. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye. Who is the ye? Israel, Israel the nation of Israel. For, here's the reason, the kingdom of what? Heaven is what? At hand. Here's what he's saying. God, according to the prophet, says, I'll send my messenger before my face. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. When, when, when Messiah shows up, there's going to be a, a man shows up called Elijah. In the spirit of power of Elijah, it's John the Baptist. When John the Baptist showed up, the king's about to show up. The kingdom is at hand. When something is at hand, you could actually reach out and do what? Grab it. It's there for, your, for you. Go over to chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 and look at verse number 17. From that time, and this is a time where uh, John was cast into prison. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent. For the kingdom of what? Heaven is what? At hand. It's almost there. Now, hold your hand. No, you can leave that. Go over to the book of Mark chapter 1. Go over to the book of Mark. So here the Lord calls it the kingdom of heaven. Watch what he calls it in the book of Mark. The book of Mark. This is written by John Mark. We saw this man in the uh, book of Acts. Uh, Mark chapter 1 and look at verse 14. Now, after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of what? God. Notice he didn't call it the kingdom of heaven. Look at the next verse. And saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of heaven or God? God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So when Matthew records it, he records the Lord Jesus Christ saying the kingdom of heaven. That's Matthew. But... When Mark records it, it's the kingdom of God. So obviously these things are really closely related to the point where they can be used interchangeably. So why the difference? Well, we're about to see that. Go to book of Daniel chapter 2. We're going to look more at these passages in Daniel on Thursdays, but Daniel chapter 2, if you will. What's the issue of the kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God? Daniel chapter 2. And uh, look at verse 28, Daniel 2, 28. In Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a, a vision, a dream, excuse me. And Daniel is the only one who can interpret it because God is with him. Daniel chapter 2, verse 28, but there, he he's speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, the king. But there is a God in where? Interesting. God should have been on the earth with Israel. The reason God is in heaven right now, or in this passage, is because Israel rejected his, his, his authority. In Israel's program, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. God is supposed to dwell with them, Emmanuel, God with us. But watch this. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and thy visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. So we'll go through those in particular, but right now we're going to keep moving. Go to verse 36. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art the, a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. Let me ask you, where was Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom? Was it a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of men? Would you say it was a real, physical, literal, visible kingdom here on earth in time? Yeah, it was. Okay? Keep that in mind. 
So it's right here, verse 38. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, and the beasts of the field, and the fowls of heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the heaven. On the what? Okay, so after Nebuchadnezzar, you have the, the, the Medes and Persians and Greece, and here we go. And so all of these kingdoms out there. Um, by the way, when, when we look at Daniel, just interesting. Nebuchadnezzar, that was the, the, the start of the times of the Gentile powers that the Lord spoke about in the book of Luke. Times of Gentile. It's going to be Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. Come on down to the, to, the, to the rest of that image. It'll be the Medes and Persians. You got the two sections, Medes and Persians. Then you're going to have Greece, Alexander the Great. Then they broke his kingdom up into four parts. One of those parts was, a, was the, uh, it ended up being the Roman Empire in history, but really it's, the, it's, the, it's going to be a renewed Babylonian Empire, Assyrian Empire in the future. That's, we'll see that when we get there. So what I want you to see, these things were real, and they were all on the earth. That's all I want you to know. So the, the God of heaven is up there. He's going to tell you about some kingdoms on the earth. Now keep reading. Uh, verse, 30, verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. We'll talk about that when we get there. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron, part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Uh, go down, if you will, to verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of who? Heaven set up a kingdom. What do you think he's going to set that kingdom up at? On the what? On the earth. All the other kingdoms were on the earth is my point. Because when you, when you deal with religious people, they're going to say, the kingdom of heaven is a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of men, and that's baloney. Just as real as Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom and all the rest of these Gentile powers, by the way, as real as Solomon and David's kingdom, the kingdom that Jesus Christ is going to set up is not going to be a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of men. It's going to have righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, but it's going to be real, man. It's going to be right here on earth. That's the point, okay? That's the point. Watch this. Verse 44, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, that's the people of Israel, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand how long? When Jesus Christ gives that kingdom to believe in Israel, that thing's going to stand forever, and no other Gentiles will ever run this earth. God created the earth for Abraham and his seed, and it's going to be through them that he rules and reigns in the person of the Lord Jesus. That's my point. The kingdom of heaven is not some spiritual kingdom in the hearts of men. Go with me to the book of Luke. Go over to Luke chapter 17. Where do they get this? It's a, it's, a, it's a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of men. Well, for two reasons. First of all, they don't rightly divide the scriptures, and they don't understand how come that kingdom didn't come. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, it's a time schedule of 70 weeks of, of years, 490 years. By the time you come up to the Lord Jesus Christ's earthly ministry, most of those years have expired. There's only seven years to go. And because that was 2,000 years ago, and they don't believe the Pauline grace message, they don't believe the word rightly divided, they make up all types of things and say, he couldn't really mean a literal kingdom, so it must be the kingdom, spiritual kingdom in the hearts of men. But here's the problem, and they'll use this verse. Every last one of them, because I dealt with them, watch this. Luke chapter 17 and verse number 19, uh, verse 20. And when he was, what's that next word? Now don't miss that. The Lord Jesus Christ is teaching. Some unbelieving Jewish religious leaders come to him and demand of him. So look at, look at the animosity towards him. Look who's speaking to him and how they're speaking to him. Unbelieving Jews are speaking to him and how they're doing. Watch this. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees 
when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. What he means is, you're not going to sit there and go low there, low here, low there. He explained that. Why? Because, he, watch, keep reading. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, is he saying that God's kingdom is within those unbelieving Pharisees? Yes or no? Oh, no, he's not. And this is the passage that people quote when they're saying, oh, it's a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of men. Even if it was a spiritual kingdom, it's not going to be in the hearts of these men these Pharisees, religious leaders who demanded of him, they don't believe on him. So what does he mean within you? It's right here among you in your midst. I'm the king. I'm the king. And, and, and when Israel receives me as their king, I'll bring my kingdom. You see that? So when people use this verse to say that it's a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of men, see who they're speaking to. The Lord is speaking to unbelieving Pharisees who demanded of him. Go over to Luke chapter 14. Look at verse 15. Luke 14, verse 15. The Lord Jesus Christ is speaking about the kingdom. There's a guy who believes, and he says, guess what? I could see this kingdom. Verse 15. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed are he that shall eat bread. Where? In the kingdom of God. Now, when you eat bread, can you eat bread in the spiritual kingdom in the hearts of men? The answer is no. Bread is literal, physical. Go over to Luke 22. I'm going to show you when he's talking about eating bread, these Jews knew what he was talking about. Luke 22, look at verse 28. This is the Lord speaking. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. So here's some people who endured to the end. Luke 22, 28. And I appoint unto you a what? Kingdom as my father appointed unto me. Okay, now let's just assume this is a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of men. That, verse 30, ye may eat and drink at my what? table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now when you read that, does that seem like that's a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of man or an actual physical literal kingdom? It's actual because when you read the Old Testament it was a privilege and honor to sit with King David at his table. Jonathan's son Mephibosheth got to sit and, and, and eat with David every day of his life. And that's, that's what he's doing. He's saying, it's a privilege and honor as my councilman, as my counsel. You will sit on thrones and you'll sit with me. He says, I'm going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and eat in the kingdom. The kingdom is real. So what I'm saying is the kingdom of God has two spheres. When Paul refers to it, he talks about the spiritual part of it. It's called the kingdom of God because that's going to be the conditions in the kingdom. There's going to be righteousness in that kingdom. There's going to be peace in that kingdom. There's going to be joy in that kingdom. Whether it's the earthly sphere of it, there's going to be righteousness, peace, and joy. Whether it's going to be us in the heavenlies, there's going to be righteousness, peace, and joy. You get that? But Paul never uses that kingdom of God, excuse me, that kingdom of heaven, because that's the one, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's the earthly kingdom, okay? So you see the difference? If, if there's any questions, let me know. Kingdom of God, overall kingdom with righteousness, peace, and joy. The condition, the state of that kingdom. The kingdom of heaven has to do with the physical, literal, earthly, Davidic kingdom. Let's, we're coming down to the end. Go back to the uh, book of Romans. And if, if that's not clear, come talk to me afterwards, and I'm, I'll try my best to make it clear. So just want you to know there is a difference. They can be used interchangeably, but there is a slight difference. Paul never uses kingdom of heaven. First, uh, excuse me, Romans chapter 14. Look at verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. That's not the issue. Talking, and by the way, Paul is talking about, Paul is talking about the, 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 the sphere where the body of Christ is going to be. 
but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Verse 18, for he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved to men. If you seek the righteousness, the peace, and joy that God has given you as a member of his kingdom, he's translated into the kingdom of his dear son, you will be acceptable to God in your conduct, and even other men will approve you. How can you not approve someone if they say, well, Brother Ron, what you said did, blah, 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 that offended me. And if I, in my freedom, I know that in their presence, I don't have to do or say that thing. I'll just tell them, sorry, didn't mean to. I won't do that. I won't say that. If it's a brother, I'm talking about a, a brother or sister in the Lord. But when they're not around, I'll say and do, eat, whatever. Uh, the, the issue of, of alcohol comes up a lot. Religion. Paul says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. The Bible doesn't prohibit adults drinking uh, alcohol. Paul says, drink, do it like an adult if you choose to do it. But if that affected a brother, let's say you and I go out. I've gone out with Chell, Amy, some of the other brethren. We'll go out as couples, Dirk and Sarah. If you go out to a, to, with, with other adults, brothers and sisters, and there, and, and, and you might want a glass of wine or whatever. You, you drink wine at home, whatever, whatever you do. But if you go out amongst them, what you say is, would this offend you if I had this glass of wine? If they say, yeah, don't have it. If they say, no, we all going to have one, get us all, you know. That's fine, too. <laughs> Just don't get bent, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There's freedom and grace. It's not this religious thing. It's, it's, I care for you. Would this offend you? You have the freedom. Just don't get drunk with the wine. That's what Paul is saying, okay? Look what he says, verse 19. Let us, therefore, follow after the things which make for what? There it is. And things. Not just peace. Because sometimes people have, people will avoid situations just to have peace for peace's sake. That's not the Apostle Paul. Truth always won over. Not only for peace and things wherewith one may what? Edify another. You want to build them up. Don't let them put you under some legalistic thing. You say, well, brother, I won't do that, or sister, I won't do that, say that but in your presence. But let me know. Paul gives me the freedom to have that, whatever it is, that glass of wine, that, that meat in Paul's day. I won't do it for, in your presence, but don't think that I'm under your legalistic ways or thinking. Paul gives me the freedom, and that's what he's saying. Seek for peace, but also edify that person. Build them up. Verse 20, for meat destroy not the work of God. What he means is don't hinder their spiritual growth over something as insignificant as eating food and drinking drink. All things indeed are what? Pure means clean in the eyes of God. Even though that meat was sacrificed to idols, God says it's just meat, man. Enjoy the steak. Enjoy the pig roast or whatever. But if it offended your Jewish brother who got saved, then don't eat it in his presence. That's what he's saying. Watch this. We'll, we'll, we'll conclude in this passage. But it is, verse 20, evil for that man who eateth with offense. That person may not be able to handle that, that drink because of his religious background or that meat in this particular case. That's fine. Verse 21. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Has thou faith? Do you have faith to eat that meat or drink that wine? Whatever it is. Have it to who? Thyself. Basically, Paul's saying, in their presence, don't do it. But when they're not there, have at it. Before God. Happy, and that word blessed. Happy is he that condemneth not who? himself in that thing which he allowed. Something personal. I like to take my wife out. She loves going to, her favorite restaurant is some Italian restaurant. She's not having wine now because she's pregnant, but we'll share a, a glass of wine or something like that. She's not a drinker. I'm not either. But I'll take my wife out and, and have that. And if, if, if there was any saint who had a problem with that in our presence, who was, I, we wouldn't have it. 
But when I'm with my wife, I'm taking her out. I'll take her to the club if I want to. Go dancing with her. Nah. I enjoy it because she's my best friend and we enjoy that. You don't have to do that. <laughs> but if you were with us and that was offended, we'd ask you before we go out, say, does that offend you? Y'all you know? understand what I'm saying. Let's end it right here, verse 23. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat or drink or do that or the woman wear the pants, whatever the religious thing is, because he eateth not of what? Ah, there it is. That's the issue. For whatsoever is not of faith is what? Faith is what's motivated by God's word to you. If you don't grasp the Pauline doctrine, that liberty you have in Christ, that's where you're at. I'm going to live where I am at in my edification. You live where you're at in your edification. That's what Paul's saying. But never let where, if you're that stronger brother or sister, never let that be a stumbling block. Always condescend to that weaker brother or sister as they grow, okay? Not in legalism, but just as patient, helping them grow. Explaining to them, I have the freedom to have this, but for your sake I won't because I love you. You get that? All right. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the truth of your word. Father, what a wonderful thing we have in grace. Oh, Father, it, it all starts with the cross of Christ. Although he was free as your son, Father, from eternity to eternity, he chose to do your will, which is to come to earth to save sinful mankind. Oh, Father, it don't matter what the sin is. That's not the issue. We're all sinners. We point our finger at each other. But you know what? We're all sinners in need of a savior. Thank you that you loved us so much that God commended his love toward us and that while we're yet sinners, not while we're trying to clean up our life, not while we're trying to do good, but while we hated you, God, and hated your ways, you still came and died for us in the person of your son. You shed your precious blood, that sinless blood for our sins. You were buried and you rose again the third day for our justification and you offer eternal life. Father, if there's anybody out there who doesn't know for sure that they have this eternal life as a present possession. Oh, Father, there's nothing waiting on them but lake, the lake of fire, hell and lake of fire. You don't want them to go there, so you ask that they hear your word today, that if they don't know for sure that when they die, they're going to spend eternity with you in heaven and not hell, then they can know right now for sure. What do they have to do, Father? Nothing but believe. Christ died for their sins on the cross. He was buried and he rose again the third day. By simple faith in Christ alone and his shed blood alone, you'll forgive them all their sins, Father, past, present, and future sins. Isn't that wonderful? You'll give them eternal life, life eternal forever, never to lose it, and then an inheritance in the heavenly places. Oh, what a gracious God we have, all because of the Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father, that we can come together. If anyone hasn't trusted you, may they tr put their trust in you right now. May you look into their heart, see them trust in that, Christ died for their sins, and may you save them this moment. We thank you for the blessing of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.